for the few people in attendance and the dozens who are listening all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, from his spare bedroom in Norfolk, England, Mark Laws, ask you to get ready to fight for There we go. We are live. Rachel, welcome to the TFIM show at long last. Oh, thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah, it's been pending me getting some Wi-Fi, which I now have. Yeah, we, well, I've, I've got administration issues and you've had technology issues, but uh, but between us, we've smoothed them both out and uh, and here we are. The um, I... I haven't done a show for two weeks and that was sort of like partly because well, I was due to do your one and then you your, your Wi-Fi was fucked and then I was thinking oh shit I need to get someone in last minute and then I thought well, why am I being a slave to having to do it every single week when no one really gives a shit that it happens every single week so so I was like, I've, I've had so I did six weeks on and then two weeks off and I thought with to be fair also with most of those shows that I thought were going to be 60 to 90 minutes and they were all two hours, two and a half hours. I think I might have even touched three hours. I thought, well, maybe it won't hurt just to give the diehard listeners an extra couple of weeks to catch up if they're doing little little chunks at a time. But here we are at last. And, and I've got to say, Mark, I am a diehard. I, I, I feel like... I need to ask you and your previous guests to send me an invoice for the therapeutic benefits I've felt from the ability to reflect as you were talking to those guys, um, you know, Danny and John and their kind of the things they've been doing with a family, uh, you know, Danny obviously with their accident, John with his big events raising money. Um, Sophie, a very honest and humble sort of sharing her bit, you know, made me think more about, um, you know, I wasn't aware of some of the details she shared about OCD. And, and I actually, one of my best friends has OCD. He's also um, got Asperger's syndrome, but just that different angle of it, it was really educational. Um, Sherry, uh, she um, actually had me sort of welling up and you know that different angle. I love listening to that American accent. She was very articulate, um, so I felt moved by that. And then obviously Stephen H, like you, I could listen to him literally all day. So um, I've learned a lot from him. And then I've got to say, Robin really warmed my heart. Um, I listened to that one uh, last week, so I do it in chunks when I'm out for a run, sort of 30 minutes. And um, yeah, I really felt. Robin, you know, she moved me quite a bit. So, because I spoke to her really early on in lockdown, and I now, it's now made me think back to when I was speaking to her online back then and what she was probably going through. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate everything you've done so far. And I'm so pumped to be on it. Um, and I feel, yeah, I feel like I've been through therapy. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll um I'll I'll send you a blank invoice and then you just put whatever value you you see fit and send it back. But I you know I I agree with you as well because I sort of I don't really know what I expected if I'm honest. I um which is I think that's probably the best way to do this because if I had if I have a plan, I want to be famous or I want to be rich or I want to get shitloads of followers or shitloads of listeners. I need to have at least x amount of listeners by a certain point it's like well you put all of those lines in the sand and and so what and even if you do achieve them well then what i wrote a um i wrote a little bit up the last week um for uh some some, some writing work i've been doing about steve at bart stephen bartlett the diary of a ceo host and um he did a quick little bit of research on his podcast and they had just hit, I think it was in September last year, 10 million listeners per month. And I was thinking, fuck, if my if one of my tangible aims was listeners to my podcast, then as soon as you hear that, you're like, well, I can't compete. So therefore, why bother entering the race? But 
at the opposite end of that spectrum, yes, that's a phenom phenomenal reach and a huge chunk of people to be able to to influence in inverted commas. But if I if I then sacked off what I was doing because I haven't got that many followers or I'm not making that much money or I'm not that popular, then conversations like we've just had in this short period of time where you've just reeled off every single person and the perfectly normal person on the other end of the conversation, but the impact and the insight you've gained from it. And so therefore, that's what makes it worth it. And it's for me, it's the it's like literally a 100 percent selfish element of, well, if I just do this as my hobby and I'm only doing it for me, and I try to get something out of it, which is exactly what you've just said you get out of it, then then therefore it doesn't matter how quickly it grows or how big it grows because I'm I'm still achieving all of my goals. And the knock on effect from that is people like yourself who do tune in and listen, who take the risk of right, well, I'll listen for an hour and see what this twat's got to got to say for himself. And then therefore you never know what bit of hidden value there, there might have been. And then if you tell someone else and they tell someone else, then organically, if it deserves to get a big audience, it will get one. But if not, it doesn't matter because it's doing what I set out to do, which is me talking to people that I find interesting for, for different reasons, asking them the same four questions that there is logic behind, which I sort of stumbled across accidentally. Um, and the whole point of that is that although there's only the same four questions, there aren't ever going to be the same four answers and every single person is going to have a different take on it and a different um, a different reason for it. And as we've spoken before from a work perspective, the thing that thing that annoys me from from a work point of view is when people say this is the way something has to be and if you don't do it this way you're stupid because this is the perfect the perfect method and I sort of that that annoys me because what about the 90% of the people who don't fit in that bra bracket perfectly who then sit at home getting anxious or nervous or um, they, they get imposter syndrome or they they feel insignificant because they're not doing the thing that everyone is supposed to be doing in in the way that they're supposed to be doing it and I, how many people do we lose how many good people get get washed aside in whatever industry purely because they don't they, they no one's ever probably said to them that listen there's a thousand fucking ways of doing everything. There's some better ways and some worse ways, but it doesn't really matter. You, you'll find a way. And as long as you keep learning and developing and make mistakes and learn from them and improve, then find a way that suits you. And then it doesn't matter what anybody on Instagram says because you have found a way that suits you. Yeah, and I think that's where it resonated with me with Robin, because you know that's in a nutshell what she said. She kind of found that by being vulnerable uh, she was doing it differently to a lot of the instagrammers for example and yet that's what made her appeal to her particular demographic and i think that's where i resonate as well i'm not about i mean i mess about with filters sometimes but uh, they're obvious ones rather than you know trying to look flawless uh, but yeah, i think in a nutshell you kind of basically if i was to kind of put a a description on the way I've led my life I think you, you've kind of said it and, and it, this is what I'm grateful we'll get into this obviously as we go through today but the, the gift from my parents was always from very young just do what you love and uh, and that has stood me in good stead I haven't always done that but then I've always found that when I've done that that's where I felt the most success and interestingly not just in the personal professional development side but even in the financial side because if you're doing something you really, really enjoy and you can create an income from it, then it's kind of it's easy. Um, but we'll obviously get into all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So so for somebody who maybe has got nothing to do with the, the, the fitness industry and they might know me from from personally, if, if they've got the misfortune of that or they might have been um, told to listen to this amazing podcast so they might not know either of us but obviously we know each other 
very well through work through the fitness industry um we're we're currently colleagues working with and for the same the same company but uh, there is i am future fit well i've gone for my i've gone for the, it's, it's christmas so i've got the big christmas guns out i like it. i love a christmas i love a christmas jumper um so so yeah we we've known each other for a long time through work probably getting on for 10 years i dare say and we've spoken a lot we've spent a lot of time together in a work environment and there's there's a huge amount of of praise and respect that I can send your way for, for the work that you do and the way you do it and and we, we can elaborate on that as we go through but the reason you're of interest to me for this is because we sort of I don't think we've probably never spoken about non-work stuff I know I know we share a lot of the same values and principles and we we think very similarly in a work context and I gather there's a knock on effect from that into personal life and, and, and things like that. But but yeah, someone for someone who is so high within a, within a niche in the fitness industry that, that I respect so much, it fascinates me to sort of to know all of the stuff that's happened before what's underneath the surface of the water on that iceberg because i only know the sprinkling of dust on the tip of the iceberg but i i don't i don't know a lot i can guess some bits but i don't know a huge amount that's underneath so so therefore you are yeah you are very you're of great interest to me and hopefully to my handful of listeners as well of which you're one of so unless you listen to this back yourself <laughs> And it's interesting because that's where I've gone listening to the other guys previously is I'm aware that you didn't want this to be all about health and fitness. However, my entire life almost we will get to that uh, has been about health and fitness. And so I don't really separate work and personal life. There's, there's just this complete merging because I just do what I love, which is health, fitness, movement and biomechanics. So. Um, to sort of dissect it as I was listening to the other guys and think, yeah, what would I say? I found really um, insightful and very reflective for me. And I'm quite reflective anyway, uh, have been for years, which again, I'll share something with you that I don't think anybody listening, especially you, will know about. So a little mm -hmm. um, a little mic drop later on, hopefully. Um, but but for, for the reason that because I'm reflective and then I listened to your podcasts and I felt reflective in a different way. I think that was the joy I got from it was was the way you took us with those questions. Yeah, Hopefully it'll be interesting to somebody listening as well. <laughs> uh, well, absolutely. But if it's not, fuck them, because it only has to be interesting to me. That's 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 the only thing that matters. And um, obviously I'm semi joking. Well, I don't know if I am actually. But I would like it if some people find it interesting as well. But I suppose it's a case of rather than trying to do something that I think everyone will find interesting, I'm more interested in doing what I find interesting and then putting it in front of other people who are similarly minded, if that if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've said I've said to a couple of people in in previous episodes about it. This isn't a health and fitness podcast and, and it's not and all I mean by I don't, I don't mean by that we must never talk about health or fitness because that's all I know as well um, it's more of a case of I don't want to talk to you today about the 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 I don't know the nuances of biomechanics and should a, should a test be done this way or that way or which is most accurate or which study is has got the most substance behind it all, all that sort of stuff that are a non- a non-industry person wouldn't find interesting but if everything comes back to work that there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that at all not not in the slightest um i know you've listened to all of the previous shows uh so you know the quick fire round that's coming i'm going to bang that out now and then we'll get into the first of my four questions um so you know the gig uh, you're, the end of the world is coming. You've got um, you've got an opportunity to have to experience 
all of these things one more time, uh, what would your last meal be? Easy. Watermelon starter, sashimi yeah. Japanese main and coconut ice cream dessert. Very, very fruity. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, I never thought. Uh, what drink would you have to wash it down with? Oh, a pint of appetizer. Oh, even more fruity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what movie would you be watching? Oh, do you know what? I had a few of these and, and I, I always come back to Tarantino. You'll know from some of my answers it'll be Tarantino all the way. Uh, probably Pulp Fiction. What a film. Yeah, yeah. Um, last band or musician that you would listen to? I found this tough as well. There's a guy called um, Jerry Cinnamon. Scottish guy um, yep. and I went to see him live uh, at the Rock City in Nottingham when there was just 150 of us wow. and it was just I even bought a t-shirt like proper like <laughs> you know groupie uh, brilliant Jerry Cinnamon uh, there's a song he does called Belter Belter so you can yeah. imagine a Scottish actor. she she is a belter yeah uh, but just to add on to that and I'll, I'll talk about this later on is there's a song uh, that, that everyone will know by John Lennon, which is called Imagine, which I'm going to refer back to later. But being a trash TV fan on Britain's Got Talent, there was a guy called Chris Clafford who did a cover of it and made me cry. Wow. So I might choose that one as well. Mm, the power, the power of music, hey? <laughs> um, what would be the last book you would read? So this, this is my mic drop. Um, there's a book that has, uh, I worked it out, something like 8 million words in it. Jeez. And I calculated that because I've written it. And it took, it's taken me 47 years and it's every single day of my life. For Diary. 47 years from the age of seven, I think it was, something like that. Wow, that's interesting. So um, I take my time and read that again. <laughs> have you? Uh, do you have any plans to sort of share it, or is it just mega personal and just for your own? No, I, I mean I wrote it for my grandkids, that, but they're never going to happen. Well, I say that I've got I've just married into thirteen grandkids, um, but I'd originally written it to pass down. My dad's quite, um, you know, a bit of a historian. But the more I've thought about it now, I thought, well, maybe I should just burn them. There's some of them. I would have to do it anonymously. I'd get a few people into trouble if people knew it was me and I was brutally honest. So I'd, <laughs> that's the kind of weighing up as to whether I would be able to do it. Uh, I'd probably have to put a ghost writer name on it or something. Yeah, but even even if it's just for your own pleasure yeah. and you, uh, you've you got them all like in little notebooks or something. I've got an A4, well the, the last probably 40 odd years is, is an A4 everyday page. Wow, incredible, yeah. incredible. Um, what would be the last town or city you would visit? Japan, Tokyo. Nice. Um, last hobby you would partake in? Walking where there are no humans with my husband and the two dogs. Early morning, sun's rising. What what time of year would it be? Autumn. Oh, nice. Yeah. With some red leaves on the floor. Mm, very good. Um, and who would be the last iconic person that you would that you would want to hear from or be exposed to? There's two. One who's no longer with us. He died in 2021, and he's my. Um, education hero if you like so ken robinson and then another one who is still alive uh and he's he's what he's an agitator uh, ricky gervais fascinates me and the more i've watched him the more i got it and then um, i just i could listen to him all day yeah i like ricky gervais i've seen ricky i've seen him live the first time he ever did stand-up comedy it was at the um it was at the Royal Albert Hall and it was like a teenage cancer trust um, like comedy night and Ricky Gervais was the headliner and God, the but Lee Mack was on there, uh, Russell Brand was the compare, so he came on like half a dozen times. Um, who else was on there? Do, 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 do. Sean Locke was on oh, there. It sure. was literally, it was, it was unbelievable. But at the end of the night, I, I, it was probably one of the most expensive tickets I've ever bought in my life. It was probably like, 
130, 140 quid for the ticket or something. But I, the, the pain I was in, I, at one point I nearly like fe- literally slipped off my chair because I physically couldn't hold myself up anymore. I was just crying with laughter. It was the funniest night I've ever, I've ever had. And that was the first night, I, I can't remember the first stand up he did. Uh, was it politics or uh, I can't remember the um, the exact one, but that was basically where he first did it on on stage, and it was it was brilliant, so yeah. fun. His religion one, uh, where he, he reads from the book and shows the images and the descriptions, and then Noah and the Ark, and uh, he and and Sean Locke. I've got to say, I could watch Sean Locke telling the same jokes fifty times, and I would still belly laugh. Um, yeah. bless him. Absolutely, yeah, what a legend. Um, the other guy you mentioned, uh, so Ken Robinson. Ken Robinson, yeah, he um, is. Is he the guy? Is he the guy that has like a? Is it a TED talk or a YouTube video where he's talking about? Is he talking about like the education system and how it probably doesn't work as well as it could do? Is that the right? Is that the guy? Yeah, he. Um, he, I think it's the most watched TED talk ever. Um, and he talks about creative intelligence, which yeah. I know resonates with yourself as well in terms of being labelled not, not a non-academic um, as a child, which I felt interfered with my perception of my own intelligence. And so the way in that one single talk, the way he described um, differences in intelligence, the, the flaws in the education system being based on an industrial Kind of revolution coming out, we need it to spell and mm. uh, and do maths has been detrimental to children's creativity uh, and the evidence showing that school actually squashes imagination and intelligence and it's creative creative intelligence that comes up with new ideas and technologies and science questions and you know and so he gave me confidence, particularly as an educator that when I teach to use some of his concepts and principles and arguments and beliefs to to help people who feel like me or maybe felt like me. So he wrote a book called The Element, which is um, within my top, I've got loads of favorite books, so I'd better say top 10. Um, And it's a description of all the most um, successful and famous people who were not academic, Mm-hmm. Um, and failed at school, you know, you, you, um, uh, Paul McCartney, who's talking about uh, John Lennon, but there, there, there's a, a whole bunch of people in there who've been hugely successful, even without, I mean, I think um, John Lennon and Paul McCartney were in the same music class, and they were told they would never amount to anything. Yeah. <laughs> a music teacher will be kicking themselves, but that's what that book and then he wrote a subsequent book which is called finding your element and within it he sort of describes ways to um to take yourself through some tasks so mind maps and things that make you happy and what you enjoy to find out the moments when you feel like you're in your element and the element doesn't have to be work could be a hobby could be something separate but if you can find something that makes you happy and you know gives you that purpose that that's when you're in your element when time doesn't exist and so when I'm in a group teaching either education programs or or fitness classes I know that is that's me and my element so uh, but you, you, can you get into you get into that sort of flow state that, that, yeah. that's talked about a lot where you sort of almost you get the perfect balance of challenge and enjoyment that means that you're not challenging, you're not challenged so much that you find something so difficult that you can't do it for longer. And you don't just enjoy something so much that it, it's it's too easy that you, you don't have to even like try. You just get like the, the sweet spot, the perfect balance between the two where before you know it, four hours have gone by and it feels like 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly that Mark. Yeah, exactly. The zone. Yeah, I, mean, I I think I, I need to check my Instagram bio, but I'm pretty sure I still advertise myself as a, a straight C student, which is which is 100 percent accurate. I, I've never I, I did get a couple of B's at GCSC and I might have blagged a B in my English um, at A level. But other than that, 
like perfectly average C's all the way, like a couple of D's, a couple of B's, but but a C average. Uh, and I went to a school where like eight A stars, nine A stars was the norm. Like literally there would be people crying. Like, What's wrong? I've got eight A stars and an A. And I'm like, you fucking moron. Like, are you shitting me? Like, that's not a problem. How about five C's? Stick that in your fucking pipe and smoke yeah. it. So I, I thought we're educators. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's weird, isn't it? How sort of I, education was wasted on me. The education, formal education, was wasted on me until I probably got into my late twenties, early thirties, when I then needed I wanted to know more about certain topics that interested me so that I could get better at this thing that I loved which was making people stronger and faster and to be able to go for longer and and whatever it is they wanted and that was where I then would go out of my way to buy books like academic books not like stuff with pictures in it and like I would subscribe to things or I would go on courses and I would I would be at bedtime. I would be listening to things that are making me better, like academic sources of information rather than just watching Love Island or Big Brother or whatever it was. So it was it, it took me until I was way past school age to 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 want to go and learn the right things and I, I scraped through school I, I, I probably did better than a lot of people because I got B's and C's and I got three A levels I got nine GCSEs with my eyes shut and both hands tied behind my back just concentrating on playing sport and messing around making sure I was the the biggest class clown and the biggest idiot in in the school and as long as I achieved all of those I was I was happy but I sort of had had the potential like I could have got shitloads of A's it just didn't interest me in the slightest and I sort of in a way I suppose at the time my mum and dad were probably not overly chuffed with with the, the disappointment but the positive was the sort of my intelligence was there it was just that my application to school at that time it just didn't I just didn't give a shit and I was more interested in doing things that I really liked and enjoyed and I'd had at the same time my dad who my dad's manual labor like worked himself to the to the bone like for decades still does now at 75 years old and he's only now slowing down because his body's making him but he he always said that it doesn't matter what you do for lit for a living you just make sure that you enjoy it because you've got to do it for 50 years and I sort of, I always had that at the back of my mind that I could be a lawyer, but I really like fighting around and running around and sort of doing push-ups or cross country or whatever. So sort of, I accidentally found a way to make a living out of what I loved, which as you touched on earlier, sort of means that you don't actually ever work a day in your life because you, you just have that perfect balance. And the, the beauty of the world we live in these days for all of its flaws and it's um and it's it's fuck ups is that you can now make a living doing anything with an internet connection a webcam a hard drive and a social media account you would think of the most obscure and ridiculous thing going but you can find access to a thousand people around the world that will give you a couple of quid a month for it and you've you've got a, an average income like happy days yeah, and, it, and it's funny because my parents were both teachers. My dad was a history teacher and a maths teacher, weirdly. I was in the Dunces class of maths. Um, and my mum taught um, dance, geography and English. And they were very much, when, when I was at school, it, it, what you did is you went to school, you went to college or A-level, and then you went to university to get a job. And it was expected. So I think for a lot of my early life, maybe even to my mid 30s late 30s i felt like i just wasn't intelligent enough to have a job of any intelligence and that's indicative of the kind of job i took but i, I definitely had a phase sort of around about 18 
where it was quite, in my world, it was quite dark. Um, I, I, I had no reason to get up. I had no job. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no boyfriend, no money. I was living at home. And it was just, I had no sort of, there was no purpose. And, and I just, I feel that it was maybe the, I don't think it was that I didn't want to learn. It's just the learning that was offered to me wasn't in a format that I could absorb it and process it. Um, and maybe I've got some ADHD tendencies or, you know, some slight dyslexia. And, and, and I, you know, I, this is with no disrespect to Robin. I don't want a diagnosis because it, it wouldn't change anything I do. But the acknowledgement from Ken Robinson's work about knowing that the way I absorb and process information, if I can learn how I do that best, translate the, the content I want to absorb into that format, then I can do maths, I can do science, I can do, you know, other um, academic subjects. And so I think, uh, but I didn't learn that till really late on, Mark. And I, I guess, I know we're going to get onto regrets later on. It's not a big regret because I've got there. Um, but it was a, a time where, you know, I thought, oh, I'll, I, I'll just have babies and, you know, uh, work in a care home. And not not that that was a bad thing, but it that was it. Yeah, yeah. I like having there babies. No, there was no sort of like higher aspiration there that you were working towards because you hadn't found the first rung of the ladder yet. You didn't, you didn't know which way you were going up. Yeah, I, but I mean, somewhere in the back of my head, I can remember it, having this desire to own a business. I don't know what business and I don't know where it came from, but I bet I had this kind of fantasy of, of having my own business that was just never going to happen. But it was somewhere back here hmm. um, that I then, you know, when it came to a point that it was starting to happen, sort of like um, mid thirties, really, when, when I met Martin, that I just kind of, grabbed hold of it and I was like right I'm, I'm yeah I'm gonna do the Richard Branson and go yes and, and just work it out later I'm just gonna you know work it out which you know we can share when we get to that point but um prior to that you know I was just gonna I was gonna get married at 24 have a boy <laughs> at 26 have a girl at 28 and then you know I mean that that was how my mind was working so bizarre how it turns out it, but it Everyone's mind works like that, doesn't it? I, I was having a chat with somebody. I think it was it wasn't on a podcast. I was chatting with with a mate of mine who I played football with last week, and sort of was sort of saying that how many people have? Oh, it wasn't actually. I was talking to my next guest who I'm recording just before Christmas, Jamie Cartwright. That will be a very 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 good one. Um, I was talking to him on the phone last Saturday as I was driving up to Leeds, and sort of saying that. How many people, whether, whether you're a teenager and you like, right, I'm going to go to school and I get a job, then I'm going to have a career, I'm going to get promoted, then I'm going to buy a house, I'm going to get married, I'm going to have kids. You know, right, that's my 20, 30 year plan. Like, you've got to have a plan because if you haven't got a plan, you like, how do you know like when you achieve anything? You go, that's my plan. But then what if something goes wrong? What if someone dies? What if you lose your job? What if you have an accident? What if you can't walk again? Like what there's so many, all right, for most people, most of the time, something like a real personal trauma or a tragedy isn't going to happen. But what if it does? And if that plan is in your head and you think that's success, chances are speak to anybody who's 40 50 60 and ask them how their plan was going from when they were 18 20 and they'll god the, the the difference will be will be vast and sort of the point i want to get across to people whether they're listening to this and they're really young at the start of their journey or whether they're my age your age or older and they're sort of in the middle or towards the end of their journey is like it, it doesn't it doesn't matter how it's gone or or whether you know what the next step is it doesn't even matter i'm 41 i say this all the time i don't really know what i want to do when i grow up for a living i'm not a hundred percent sure i change my mind most weeks and that's okay by not saying that out loud and pretending 
But when you take a picture of your beautiful house and family and job and putting it all on Instagram and everyone else looks at it and goes, oh, fuck, everyone else has got it nailed. They've got kids, they're married, they've got the job, job of their dreams. They're so happy. Shit. I don't dare tell, I don't dare say that, that I don't really know what I'm doing because everyone else has got it nailed. But everyone else hasn't got it nailed. There's a very, very small number of people, a minuscule percentage that actually are really content and comfortable. And there's there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't judge yourself against them. No, absolutely. And, and I think when um, when I look back, the, the, the growth and the development was it was all the, the regrets, things that happened. You know, we talked about I know all the past sort of um, guests you've had on have talked about oh, I don't have regrets and, and I've learned from them and I think it's it's those mistakes that have been so valuable uh, or, or the ability to reflect and, and it may be down to my diary um, having that journal sort of every day and looking back um, that then it was a process and, and it, there were points where things sort of happened that the direction just had to change or it, it was changing without my control um but i remember vividly having this feeling of well not not i'm not very bright i knew i had intelligence but there, there was I, I was definitely squashed i was definitely you know that there, there's something in me but it's it's maybe it's not going to come it's just it's just not for me i'm not a i'm not an entrepreneur uh you know five businesses later um but it just wasn't in the pipeline i wasn't going to be a teacher that wasn't that was never in my plan um you know kids was the bulk of my first 40 years of life it was i was just gonna have babies that was it mm -hmm. so um and i think where danny your first guest you know is a great example of even very recently going through something like she did to then and having kids to then literally just change direction and, and adapt, she had no choice. Well, she's got two choices. She could either wallow in it or do something about it, you know. Yeah. Um, and something I, I teach to people, which I, I learned very early on somewhere, was there's, there's things you can control and then there's things you care about that you can't control that can take up so much time in your thought process and the things you talk about and do. And it's a waste of time because you can't change it. So let's just kind of remove that or write it down and then have this circle of control where right, I can do something about this. And I've, I've always had a bit of that bit of that fire in the belly. Of, right. I can do this. So I'm, I'm going to go this way instead. Um, yeah, massively. I, I, I've, I've had that. I don't know whether it was sort of ingrained in me or whether I just worked it out for myself or whether it was some sort of genetic predisposition that I've had, who knows. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely have sort of had that. It was probably, it was probably due to how naughty I always was because I could, I could then just really easily compartmentalise stuff. Be like, right, I've been really naughty doing this thing. I've got in trouble for it. I'm like, right, okay. I'm sorry, like, there's no point me sulking about it because it's not going to undo it. So let's just crack on and move on. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that nothing has uh, consequences because obviously they do. But from a, from a young age, I was very, I just became really good at sort of like, draw a line in the sand. There's no point crying about it. Like, it's just, it's done. What can we learn from it? Right. I won't do it again. Happy day. Let's let's move on. Like, come on, mum. Don't be annoyed with me. I've said sorry. Let's forget about it. Like that. That was my sort of go-to daily, daily attitude. That's probably still going strong at, <laughs> these, <laughs> these days. And I'll tell you another thing. I remember as well is just quickly before I um before I ask you the first question. When you talked about um always wanting to run your own business, but sort of not really knowing how or whether you could or or whatnot i my uh, my my mum still talks about like parents evenings from when i was at primary school whereby the teacher would say right everybody listen we're gonna do this this and this off you go and then mark's hand would go up and the, the teachers like would tell us we're like oh for fuck's sake and we're like yes mark and every time mark because she's like right miss so just to clarify 
we're going to do this and we're going to do it this way and then we're going to do that why aren't we doing that bit first and i would i would question every single thing like why are we doing it like that why don't we do it like this and like obviously they had their reasons but i needed to understand the reasons for me to understand why i'm doing what i've been asked to then as i got older and i used to go to work with my dad as a 14 15 16 year old just to earn a bit of pocket money my dad's been a professional builder by that stage for probably 30 40 years he whether it's electrics plumbing you name it he can do it and he'd be like right just do this and i'll be like why are we doing it like that dad it's like why, why don't we do it it's like just fucking do it I, this is my job this is how that's how you do it yeah but what if we did it like this no 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 no. there's no risk this is the way we do it and even now like he was helping me sort some shit out in the in the shed two three weeks ago and i was like hang on a minute wait i know you've done it like all your life like this but why don't we do it like that because like, that's not how it's done and we're fucking arguing now 40 years on because i am questioning why he's doing everything the way he's doing it and he might be doing it the perfect way but in my head i have to question why it's being done that way in case there's a better way there's a more efficient way a more effective way and even though i don't understand the first thing about the, the subject matter i'm still asking those why why are you doing it like that because i partly nosiness partly because i sort of I need to understand it better before I do what you tell me to do, which is probably why I'm 90% unemployable and I've had no choice but to run work for myself most of the time because I know when I sit there for two hours, I'm constantly, why, 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 why? I'm constantly questioning things and I've questioned them so, so much that I then understand it well enough to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's what I try and get my learners to do all the time is challenge everything. It's a healthy way to be, I think. Well, yeah. depending on the dosage of challenge. I yeah. <laughs> Wasn't very healthy for my poor teachers who all took early retirement. <laughs> Bless them. Um, Rachel, question one. Who the hell is Rachel Francis Thompson? Otherwise known as Rachel France for the most of the time that I've known you yeah well interesting because my uh name by birth was rachel ainsco um but no, no, i don't know how many people know that um who would be listening in but I, I think i tried to make this as simple as i could and i'm definitely a 53 year old teenager non-academic level two aerobics instructor who is loyal to a fault um, and I believe in humanity and sort of you know being kind to others um, and I'm definitely a people pleaser which I wish I wasn't in some cases um, but yeah I, I feel that I'm definitely a big kid and I remember my mum who's now 82, 81 sorry mum if you're listening, uh, 81, 82 she said to me over the years, I'm still 16 in here. I'm still 28 in here. I'm still 35 in here. And I think back, and I am still that 14 year old girl. I'm still, the, the, your previous guests talked about it, you know, in their letters at the end where they talked to their 17 year old self. And I thought, yeah, that I'm, I'm still there. I'm still that, you know, horrible child. I'm still that painfully shy child. I'm still um, the, 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 non-academic who, who questions her own intelligence but then immediately comes back with a response to herself so that i always think of myself as the the angel and the devil rage and that they argue with themselves in my head about myself <laughs> about uh yeah you're not that bright and it's like no you are you, you look what you're doing you're teaching biomechanics to physios sometimes and then yeah but you're just winging it you know it's because the subject you teach is really simple well no actually you're doing all right and it's this like not in not in a negative way, in a good way that I'm able to listen to that. But I'm the first to jump on a kid's trampoline, a bouncy castle, to say let's get fancy dressed up, you know, to wear um, silly outfits. Um, I my husband has um, a large 
brood of offspring and i wondered i wondered where we were going there rach it's a, it's a family show <laughs> you might your 81 year old mother might be listening <laughs> a large brood of offspring which okay. has brought me 13 grandchildren all under the age of 10 and so i'm i'm able even though for 40 years i thought i'd have my own kids and then i had a period where i thought i'm never gonna have any kids and then now i have all these babies and children that are passed me to enjoy for a short period of time um because i've had a nine hour sleep and you know plenty of food and rest that then i can pass back and so um you know i'm the one who will get on the trap loop everyone says you've got so much energy i'm like yeah but i've had nine hours sleep <laughs> so you know uh but yeah i think that is me i, I kind of thought through this one when I was out running and listening to your speakers and, and I thought of it in decades and, and I know that sort of up to the age of sort of early school I was painfully shy I mean literally I had book teeth I had a gap in the front I had you know a very tomboy approach all the all the kids that lived around us were boys so I played kick the bucket and jumping in the trees and you know, freewheeling it on a bike down the hill. And so all the girls at school to me were pretty and um, had nice clothes and I just didn't. And, and so very uncomfortable in my skin. Um, and yet I went home to this this family and environment of just pure love and joy. We walked around naked, we weren't shy or anything. Um, so my mum started to put me through dance school and modelling school. Uh, modelling, that's hilarious. If you saw the photos, I think they were just making money off some ugly kids that the parents were, you know, hopeful of. So from the age of sort of 10, I started disco dancing. So you can have some images in your mind now of sort of 10, 11 year old skinny Rach um, in a full kind of white lycra leotard with a gold sequined belt and headband and wristbands, disco dancing, and uh, you know, mum at the side, trying like, just enjoy it, smile, and uh, trying to encourage me to have confidence. And so, through the school, I think it was when I got to, I think it all changed at 13, Mark. I was, I got to school at 11, 12, 13, bunches in my hair, A line pleated skirt, below the knee socks plimpsels and a satchel and then within the same year I ended up with a, a side ponytail, earrings, tiny mini skirt, socks pulled right up to my thighs, you know, leather ankle boots, um, chuffing it on the way home from school, chuffing it, by the way, if, you, if you're listening and not watching, I'm doing a symbol as if I'm smoking a fag, um, started a rebellion that was just probably uh, well, I, I know it was a nightmare for my parents. So I went through a very rebellious stage um, through my teens. And then, as I said to you about around about 18, I felt worthless. I felt didn't know where I was going. And, and for any parent who's listening, who has a teenage girl, there was no trauma in my life. There was no bad parenting. There was no, it wasn't strict. It wasn't too relaxed. I just felt hormones create a rage and a rebellion in me that I couldn't describe even today that I could not stop I couldn't help it and I was vile Mark I, I was horrid to my poor mother and father uh, but throughout that phase they constantly said I love you you'll always have a roof over your head don't like you right now but I love you wherever you go wherever you hide and you run away I'll come and find you and there was this kind of undercurrent in the midst of all the arguments where my mum was able to put that in, 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 aside in this argument and still say to me, I still love you. I, I will come and find you. My love is unconditional. You know, you can be mean, you can be horrible and I don't like what you're doing, but I will always love you no matter what you do. And I, I did some horrible stuff. Um, but I, I think that the reason I'm talking about that is I think that, that at my worst times in terms of being a hideous person and character, that I had that all the time. And then it stayed with me forever. But I'm talking about it, you know, at the age of 53, it was clearly powerful. Um, but then going into my 
20s, early 20s, I started doing care work. So I spent 10 years working in the care industry because it was easy. Um, I was a civil service waitress, so I had two or three jobs. And once I got jobs, I kind of got a really strong worth, work ethic that came from, uh, certainly from my dad, to you know get up, turn up, be on time, um, do your thing. I was paid £1.75 an hour. Uh, you know, tips back then as a silver service waitress, finding 10p under a cup was way, you know. Um, but I think that's where I then got, oh, I like working. I like being involved. So I did care for about 10 years, but I think I was 21 and I'd been, um, started going to the gym at 16. And I'd met a girl called Melinda, who's still my best friend today. And we were I can't even remember what it was. We were in a gym. We used to make up dance routines. And at 21, she rang me from Greece and said, um, she was in Athens. She said, oh, Rach, there's a girl who's um, broken a leg. You know, do you want to come out and work in this dance troupe? And I was like, what, me? You've got no chance. I'm rubbish. That kind of like, you know, definitely. I was like, I can't do that. No, no, you can. I know you can. I've seen you move. So this was on a Tuesday night and I spoke to mum and I remember years later, mum said it was the hardest thing she ever did. But she said to me, you need to go. This is amazing. This is a great opportunity. So on the Friday, I was flying out to Athens thinking on my own, thinking, oh, my God, they're all going to be six foot leggy blondes. Um, little old me turns up, can't, you know, not a very good dancer. And um, I got there and there's this dorm with 12 beds in it, you know, all lying there. Fags hanging out the mound, you know. Oh, just I was like, well, okay. I, I'm I'm imagining like a scene out of like Greece or something with um, <laughs> where, where, where they're singing like Sandra D one, you know, where they were having like a sleepover yeah. and. <laughs> exactly that. Exactly that. Uh, and I think that was the first step to completely change my world. So where I'd um, come from, this painfully shy rebellious, no purpose, not academic, not very bright, I'm worthless, uh, child, teenager. So then suddenly I'm in Greece. Um, I was on, I don't know, 150 quid a week. They gave us digs and we had um, food allowance so I could save that money. So it's a lot to me. Um, dancing in a dance troupe, shifter tellying around some Greek singer in a um, in a bazooki bar and um, it was a whole new world, the whole of the world. I realised there wasn't a toilet roll fairy who just came out and put the toilet roll, refreshed the toilet roll. There was, a, you know, <laughs> washed my pants and socks and I suddenly had this awakening of, oh my God, all the things my parents did for me, you know, um, and, and I, I think I did a, it was a three month contract and I, I came home six years later. Wow. So I travelled to Tokyo, Hong Kong, Greece. Uh, you know, it was about six year trip it ended up being. So it was quite uh, an experience. And another, here's a thing that people won't know. So you like football? I have yeah. been known to like a bit of football, yeah. So are you familiar with the Greek teams? Uh, it's Parathenaikos and Olympiakos. So they're the two top Greek teams. Yeah. So if you look up, you might kill me for this, uh, but I could sell it for thousands to uh, the Greek Hello magazine. Um, I dated the David Beckham of Greece, Greek football back in the 90s. So he was called Demis Nikolaidis. Uh, I think he's now a manager. I'm not sure, but I'm not sure Greece are that. Uh, top of the ranking these days, are they? But um, but yeah, he was super famous. Um, I think he still is. So I dated him for the two years I was out in Greece. Um, like my claim to fame, but I won't. I won't. I won't dibs on you, Demi. Demi, if you're listening, I'm not going to. Yeah, I, I, I think he listens some weeks, but not every week. So he <laughs> might miss this one. <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, it, it changed my world and and my outlook and I saw poverty. I worked with Filipinos. Uh, I worked with people who were having to sell themselves for to feed their families at home. You know, they were married with all kids in, in the Philippines. They were having to sell themselves. And it was 
this real wake-up call that how lucky I am to be British. Um, you know, we have an NHS. We have as much as we, you know, we we kind of come down on the NHS and and the government. We have it. We have a pension schemes. We have. Uh, it's not the doll anymore, is it? I don't know what it's called, job seekers or whatever it is. You know, we have these systems in place. Other countries don't. If, in other countries, once you're old, that's it. You know, your family looks after you or you're out on the street. Um, so I had this big, big wake up call and, and this recognition of how lucky I was and how amazing my parents were. I kind of always knew it, but I, I did have a phase where I, I hated the guts. I was the black sheep. You know, and it was all I know. knew it was all from me, but butted up against it. Um, but when I came back, I came back a different person. I think it was 19, 1996 when I uh, came home. So um, but from there, I I got back into care work and I was very blessed to meet um, uh, some people when I was I was an agency staff working in old people's homes and with disabled. And I met Risha who was a uh, disabled lady with cerebral palsy, confined to a wheelchair, and she had a six month old baby. She was married. Um, she was doing a PhD at Loughborough University, so she's perfectly intelligent, but she needed 24 hour care. So, but she propositioned me and said, look, I, I need a permanent carer. Would you work for me privately rather than through the agency? I can pay you more, but it costs me less because the agency is quite expensive. I was like, yeah, sounds good to me being around a baby, you know, a six month old baby. I was like, yeah, I'm in heaven. Um, and alongside that, there was my friend with Asperger's I talked about earlier in OCD. Uh, Chris, his mum said, you know, we'd like to take you on permanently. So I managed to get these two permanent jobs, but they gave me the freedom to start to invest in uh, my my hobby, which had become fitness and moving and become a gym instructor, aerobics instructor. And I think looking back, Mark, one of my favourite jobs was eight years as a level two gym instructor, um, at a little gym in the village where I just got to speak to the members all day. Yeah. And, uh, and it was great. And they teach classes and it was a real. But at the time, I didn't know that. At the time, I thought I need to be a level three. I need to be you know, a manager, I need to be more than that. There was always this perception of um, I needed to be more. Um, this was uh, the lower level of the ranking. And yet still today, my, they're, they're still my favourite job is level two aerobics instruction. Um, so I had this balance between gaining fitness qualifications, therapy qualifications, working in the care industry, and it kind of all kind of came together. And that's when my next big game changer happened because Martin Haynes was a member at the gym um, and he was a physio who'd done a whole stack of research and meeting him totally changed my life um, and, but I think I needed that period of time away to develop a self-confidence and, and an independence to have the confidence to then when Martin approached me and said, I've done some research, do you want to help me make it into education to have the confidence to go, yeah, yeah, I'll have a go at that. Um, as, as, you were, as you were going through bits of the story and, and, and your answer there, there's like my, it's probably my personal bias because I've got a thing about opposites and opposing forces and how, how we, too many people probably think they need one direction but I think when you've got the yin and the yang the hot and the cold and you learn which one is appropriate at which time and how they complement each other as well as how they contrast against each other that's where the real fucking magic happens and as you were going through there you got your you're approaching your mid 50s but you've got the mind of a teenager. You were ridiculously shy as a child, but at home you walk around naked and you're, you've got all this anger and angst, but then were ridiculously loved. And you, you went through a rebellious phase where you didn't care, but then you end up working in a care home where you literally by name and by, by nature, you're, you're caring for people. There's all of these completely opposing things, like the complete... Um, the self-proclaimed lack of confidence and and shyness, yet now you stand in front of 
crowds of people like talking in great detail about very very niche topics like the very the the, the non-academic non-academia that you've touched on loads of times but you could you could stand there now and tell me every tendon and nerve from from earlobes to your ankles and it will be words that me and other fitness professionals i've never fucking heard before and you know all of them and what they do and how they impact the body there's a ridiculous amount of intelligence there even if you didn't have the school-based academic backgrounds sim similar to me and there's like there's non like literally every sentence or paragraph you're adding to your story is giving me more opposing things that that conflict each other and i just i think too many people are scared of conflict like whether that's oh well, I, I think this and now i think that oh they're too they can't both be right so therefore i'll ignore it and i'll choose something easy to do and i i think we need conflict we need to be aware of those conflicting things and but how they help each other rather than just working them against each other yeah, and, and I thought about this because I think you mentioned it in one of the previous um, episodes. And, and there are there's two descriptive words that I feel now. Um, th th there's a book out there. Is it called One Word or something? Which I read, and, and but I can't get down to one word that describes every ethos or value within your business. But for me, it's two words. Gardeners arrived next door, oh. um, and and it really when I think about my rebellious era, um, it's the opposite of the two words that I now hold valuable that I was demonstrating. So for me now, the whole ethos and essence in my business, my personal life, my private life, um, the things I do when I write blogs, when I um, deliver educational classes. The two words are integrity and empowerment. And, and I feel that, that they're the two core values of everything within my world. But when I look back to my teenage self, that's what I lacked. I, I didn't have integrity. I was, I was a liar. I was a thief. I stole my mate's um, lockets out of her PE bag when I was seven. Um, and I got hauled up in front of the class to empty my bag and you know I was sweating buckets and I'd stolen these sweets that I wanted so I had no integrity I, I was a child I'm aware of that but the things that heavily impacted me as a child when I was rebelling and I was lying about where I was and mum thought I was dead in a gutter um, and even at the time she thought it was having no effect it was going in and I was like these are all bad things I don't like feeling like this I feel bad because I've lied, I'm, I'm having to make other lies up because I've done this thing and it made me uncomfortable. So I, I feel that, that that has what has led to now the, the core values I hope I demonstrate and hold, you know, close are integrity. And the empowerment side, I think, was maybe where I felt powerless and I felt disempowered, and this is retrospective, this is with hindsight, that had I been given some empowerment as a child from my school teachers, um, rather than being told, oh, you're in Mr Green's class for maths, yeah, and it was literally, it was called the Dunces class, I don't think the teachers called it that, but... It <laughs> they, they probably class. did in the staff room. <laughs> yeah, oh, that Rachel Ains go. Um, so that then now I want to, I would like to hopefully empower individuals to find tactics, to find a format for them to absorb information rather than feeling like it's always got to be um, text that you read to be an academic. Can we make it in a different format? And it's audio, which has been a gift to me, certainly. Um, is there a way of changing that? So what you've said is exactly how I saw it was this little lying hideous weak feeble a horrible child who was quite innocent underneath it all screaming for attention maybe I don't know I mean I was getting it so I don't know why I would scream for it but then it's now where it's fulfilled itself into my adult life it's created these two core values of integrity and empowerment 
play it playing devil's advocate to all of that is that your integrity and empowerment are so important to you for so many reasons but if you hadn't have been such an unruly delinquent if you hadn't have lacked that uh, sort of the empowerment if you hadn't if you hadn't have been such a thief would you then appreciate so much now the importance of those things that you can you can now you could speak so let's say if you went into like give a, a talk at a school like the, or something like that, a group of sixth formers and you're giving them a a, a, a talk something I've, I've done in the past myself like you understand what it's like to be the little shitbag in that room and you understand how they feel and you understand what they need to happen you you understand that they need to kind of figure out those things for themselves and you can guide them rather than typical victorian classroom sit in rows look at the board write in lines do this like i'm at the front i'm wearing a blazer therefore you must listen to me and like it, if, if you hadn't have been so disempowered or if you hadn't have had such little integrity would you now appreciate those things so much and would you be able to talk about them with so much confidence and passion because you understand them inside out like you and i i, I genuinely there's probably no right or wrong answer i don't know I'm, I'm not a psychologist but um but i i think i think coming from someone like you or someone like myself who's figured those things out and can touch on their past misdemeanors but they understand how that's enabled them to now act in an integral act with integrity or to empower others it's, it's a lot more powerful yeah de absolutely 100 percent. and i think that's where your very tricky question about regret um plays in because the people you're speaking to on this podcast have been able to take negatives and create positives whether it's you know um a spinal break whether it's you know um running for thousands of miles whether it's having ocd or whatever you know all these different things or having anxiety we've taken that negative and gone right what can i do with that because when it means so much to you or you feel it so much to then convert that into the opposite the the, the positive angle of instead of being a liar and a cheat and a thief i'm going to be all out there open and honest warts and all and very vulnerable so you're absolutely right and i hope that that is more of what comes across i know it's what robin talked about was being vulnerable was more attractive to others because the only person who really knows me is me you know mm. and i'm extremely close to my husband my family the only person who really knows me is me so you've got to be honest with yourself um and, and i do think you're right i think that's absolutely the case yeah the 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 poacher turned gamekeeper uh, it, you it's so easy for someone to turn around and go oh i'm not taking i'm not taking integrity advice from you because when you were 10 you nicked a packet of prawn cocktail crisps from the but like oh fuck me come on shit happens things change like the, the people have they, they put a little label on you like right i now am forever never going to think differently about you because 24 years ago you did this thing therefore that is what you are forever all right how many grudges do people hold where they actually could maybe get a lot more value from existing relationships if they change the way they see people or how much more value could people bring to the world if they take their past misdemeanors and start to understand why they happened how they happened like how can i how can i maybe pick the mistakes from it learn from them and improve from them and how can i then pass that message on because as we all fuck up we all do stupid things um we, we'll do the regrets question next because it's sort of you you've just mentioned it like, there's it's too easy for people to say oh, no regrets i would do it all the same again and to a certain degree some people might genuinely mean that but obviously that's that's just not the answer i want to hear i don't want to hear it too often because I, I genuinely think of all the thousands of people i've ever met or spoken to like 
I'm pretty sure it would be a 1% literally have no regrets. I think 99% of them will regret things that it's how you deal with those regrets. Like, does that then regret define you forever and you end up jumping in front of a train or off a like car park um, because it's because that regret has held on to you for so long so powerfully that it's derailed the rest of your future? Or have you learned to take that regret, stick it in a little box, don't ever forget that it's there, but don't let it shackle you and hold you back and have you learned from it so so if we go we'll go to question three what regrets does rachel have yeah yeah i mean all of that uh but i, I picked on three because uh, well the three that i'm willing to share publicly i have no idea who's watching uh and so <laughs> so yeah one would be how mean i was to my mum as a child uh and it was predominantly my mum you know, it was a very typical mum and dad sort of role in our family. There was four kids. I was, I'm second of four. Um, and I think I was probably the worst of the four of us. Um, we, we really butted up. She literally shoulder rammed the bathroom door down when I locked myself in it. And I told her to F off and I hated her. And, you know, and I, and I now look back and I am mortified and you would imagine a parent would just be, you know, as a parent and, you know, which is me, I don't know, which is another regret I'll get onto in a moment. But I'm just mortified when I think back now, the, the ability for me to empathise with mum. And I just, I, it makes me cringe. But that being said, and if you are listening, mum, I do apologise. However, I know she knows that what she did at the time was the right thing. She bashed the door down. She said... I don't like you right now, but I love you unconditionally. It doesn't matter what you do. I will always love you. I will come and find you, blah, blah, blah. So I do regret it. But with the with the hindsight at the time, it was I was awful. But I couldn't even understand it myself. Yeah. Um, have you on on that note, Rachel, have you ever spoken to your mum about it? And do you have any idea whether when she was an unruly teenager did she gob off at her parents at all is that is, is that what helped her to understand that you don't actually mean this this is just like a naughty little hormonal teenage girl phase that we haven't done anything wrong to cause it it's just a sort of rites of passage almost that a, a huge number of people go through when they're struggling to deal with school and boys and pressure and like how do I look all, all that sort of stuff no we 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 have talked about it um she knows I'm mortified about it and she's obviously fine with it uh but no she never went through it and and if you imagine going back 80 years to um what childhood was like at that time she was the youngest of three um and her two older brothers just to give you a kind of in a nutshell the kind of childhood she had were encouraged to go out and play, whereas she was taught she had to stay in to learn how to iron her husband's shirts. Very she, like strict Victorian, like dad was, goes out to work, mum's the, the homekeeper. Right. Uh, she was told she was dumpy and plain and what a shame. So um, the, the blessing of her meeting my dad, who was a real encouragement for her to go out. You know, they had the four of us when my dad basically said to mum if you want to go and do a master's degree go do it uh, you know he literally um she, if you imagine her as a um what is it a cocoon and he he helped to become this butterfly who went out and did master's degrees in listening skills and um de self-developed so as a child, no, I don't believe, or she's never spoken about it anyway, that she had that similar environment. She certainly didn't go out chuffing it around the bike sheds at 13. It was nothing like that for mum. But she, my mum and dad are both, mum probably more so than my dad, are very cosmopolitan, very worldly. From a very young age, I've been exposed to uh, diversity and disability, you know, even back when I was very young and homosexuality was not really a thing it was quite hidden still you know pre um um eddie 
um, what's his name? Is Quick. Freddie, Mer Freddie, Mercury. Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury, Eddie, Freddie. Uh, pre all of that, you know, mum and dad were bringing home uh, friends from university that were of different um, origins. They were in same sex relationship. It was nothing. So even though she had that upbringing, um, as a partnership, my parents were very forward thinking and modern uh, going back 40 odd years. They were, you know, still um, very forward thinking at that point. So so we have had the conversation, Mark, but no, I don't believe I don't know. Mom, maybe if you're listening, let me know. <laughs> Did you ever have a fag around the back of the bike? I doubt it very much. <laughs> so. It's Yeah, it just it, it fascinates me because obviously I, I'm I'm a dad of two now. Like a, uh, a 18 month old and uh, Molly just turned three a couple of weeks ago and I sort of I've, I've got all of this to come in 10 12 15 years time so I I, um, I, I dread to think yeah the, the more the more uh, inside information I can try and get my hands on beforehand the better but it's um it, it's scary but at the same time I sort of I have this thing, it happens like um, every now and then at the minute, because like the Frankie, the little one, is so small and it's still breastfed. So she's been very, very, very clingy for the last year to, to mum. She only really started warming to me or anyone else in the last probably six months almost, where she's she now like, daddy, daddy, daddy. But but she, she's very clingy with mum because mum's her food and her comfort. So because of that, Molly, who at the time was 18 months old when she was born, but because Frankie was so dependent on mum, I would then play with Molly more. So she became a little bit more of a daddy's little girl. And even like the other day, she sort of had a, a tantrum or something because she wanted me to put her shoes on or something like that. And she was like, no, mummy, you're not my mummy. I'm daddy's. And she's like, Frankie is yours and I'm daddy's. And Natasha was like getting upset about it. And I sort of had to sort of say to her, I was like, look, she's three years old. She doesn't know what she she isn't meaning that she doesn't love you. She doesn't want you. She, but every 30 seconds, she changed her mind about everything. And but it was even at that age, a year ago, she couldn't talk. Now she can tell you exactly what she thinks of you. And she can like make you cry or make you laugh. And it's sort of I'm already becoming aware of that. Like, she doesn't mean that, obviously, because she's three. She can't. She was probably even two at the time. But she's capable of saying it or acting in a way that she's in no real control over because she's she's still learning like everything. And I sort of a bit of me just wonders whether is there a bit of your mum that then sort of seeing you as you grow up. And you've got that on a more industrial scale as a teenager who can is like physically probably the same size as as, as a mum by that time. Like, did she just have that motherly sort of instinct that what she needs is she doesn't need loggerheads. She doesn't need to need me to lock horns with her. She doesn't need me to get into a slanging match and tell her what I think of her. What she needs is for me to stay calm and to tell her that I love her. I'll always be there for her. what you're doing isn't right but figure that out for yourself and I'll be here when when you do sort of thing yeah yeah definitely um it was that unconditional love um that no matter what any of us did and I wasn't the only sort of sinner but amongst me and my siblings um but it was that I think an awareness that my mum wanted to so there's two there's me and my sister and then two brothers she wanted to have girls who felt strong and independent and she wanted boys who felt that they could openly cry um, and I, I think she certainly achieved that in the four of us by varying degrees um, and maybe almost to the extreme where I was fiercely independent you know and that was what was maybe coming out was I didn't feel it because they were yeah. saying I had to do this and I didn't want to do that um, but yeah I think that it's just that constant unconditional love is so important where my friend's parents might say I hate you get out of the house I don't want to see you for the next 24 hours yeah. and while they think that the child thinks oh they know I don't mean it they may not hear that because they're, they're quite immature at that point um, and that's what my friend's parents might do and I'm not getting down on them but just 
that subconscious as a teenager yeah. where you you hear something but you you either hear it literally or you misinterpret it so no matter what my mum said about I don't like what you're doing I don't like your behavior but I love you it was very it would have been very difficult I would imagine um but it, it was very important uh, yeah. yeah no I get that completely you no matter how no matter how inconsiderate you were you can't storm out the house and go down the road thinking oh my mum is such a fucking bitch because she isn't and she wasn't being like you could be like oh I'm so frustrated right now because I'm confused and I I've got all this angst and yeah but my mum really loves me and she's really nice and like no matter how much of a little bastard I am they're really nice to me when I get home and like whereas your other friends were oh yeah my mum's a bitch is your mum a bitch my mum's a fucking bitch let's <laughs> let I'll show her and it, it, it escalates doesn't it whereas you've kind of even it's something you said earlier whereby like you're you stormed out and you're out getting up to god knows what but you always knew that at home it was safe and you were loved and it was it was a nice environment there was no you just had to in your own time get all the naughty bits out of your system yeah exactly that yeah mm. um so i guess that my, my second regret is never having kids and it just was something that that wasn't possible um it, it made me make really bad decisions so my, uh, i married when i was 31 um thinking that this guy was going to be my hero and bring me lots of babies and and it didn't happen for a variety of reasons so that literally I think the marriage failed on the marriage on the wedding night actually we weren't very married very long um but the name was easier to be memorable going into the fitness industry um the name sco which drove me nuts because everyone would okay. um say oh ain't cough ain't cough because it's pronounced ain't cough and it was an, a bane of my life through school so to keep <laughs> the name rachel france was just an easier transition in terms of being more public um but yeah I had some real struggles because I was convinced I was going to have the kids. That was my purpose. Uh, my body clock was screaming. I spent my 30s, uh, probably the early half of my 40s, making really bad decisions and actually ending up single for a lot of it because no one was father appropriate. And then yeah. those guys I ended up with, it was a desperate attempt at, well, he'll do, you know, because I need a baby. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's like it's like you've turned you've like you've turned up at Tesco's to buy a meal deal, and there's only the like coleslaw ones left or egg and crash. And you're like, oh, that'll do. But that's <laughs> probably not how you should choose uh, the father of your children. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and and yet everything about my life was around kids. My all of my friends' kids see me as a godparent or an auntie, or you know, and all my friends say, oh. If they're ever getting to a rebellious stage, we've told them, go and see Auntie Rage. Um, and obviously working with Risha, the, the, the lady, my friend who I talked about, who had a six month old, who's now 26, seven. Uh, and she had another child, Lena. Rhea, Rhea's 26 now, Lena's two years, uh, no, five years younger. So I was actually bringing, helping Risha bring up these two babies, putting them on her breast, because she was obviously breastfeeding, was the one thing she could do. I was feeding them, changing them. So I kind of had this, um, I don't know how to describe it. Not, not. I was slightly scratching the itch, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I, I did have the joy uh, that Rish, and Rish is a close friend of mine now. Well, I've worked for her for 20 years now, but we're very close friends. And we've spoken about how um, she was clearly the parent. She made all the important decisions, but I was able to do some of the, cuddling and picking them up when they hurt themselves or you know the cute stuff um and some of the uh, messy stuff as well if they're having a tantrum down the shopping aisle um so i had some of that experience for their first 10 years of life um but there's this it's hard to describe so any female who has a body clock that is saying you you want to have a baby and the, the opportunity isn't arising it's really difficult and it, it was I, I kind of it's not the same as when I was a teenager but it was this overriding hormonal response that just 
I, I would cry at NSPCC adverts. I, you know, I could actually cry now when I think about it because I'd spent so long wanting to know what my baby would look like, had names, you know, um, I had baby name books and everything else. Um, and yet when I started to get to um, 45, 7, um, I started to think th this, this is not going to happen. Um, now, it was um, what I was 38, whenever, whenever it was 2008, I'm trying to work out the math now, when I met Martin and, and my direction started to change. So I had this going on, trying to find a, a, a man who could help me have a baby, quite literally. And I was starting to get this empowerment in my working life that then I just gradually started to focus my attention on work and it literally became my baby. Mm -hmm. So uh, for 20 years, first 10 years as Intelligent Training Systems with Martin, literally 6 a.m. till 7 p.m. It was all about the business because outside of that, I, I didn't have much. Um, and this is this is not that literal, but conceptually it was, oh, well, I, I'm not going to have a baby. Men are all shits and, you know, I'm doing all right on my own. So I'm just going to work. And I actually loved my work. Um, so that, that's, I think, where work became so important because it was the distraction from I was not going to have a baby and the realisation when I hit menopause around perimenopause, about 47, uh, this is definitely not going to happen. Um, and so I got to the point where I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to foster. I'm going to leave the industry or reduce the work in the fitness industry and just foster kids. Um, so I, I was interviewed, I started to go down that process. I was doing a little bit of online dating for a bit of company um, and sort of flirty chats online. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go on one last date. And that one last date, it was a guy, um, I was on Plenty of Fish. And I put my profile up, right, I'm doing this fostering thing. I'm being, being interviewed for that. I'm enjoying my work. I'm not sure where that's going, but I really love it. So that's great. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on one date. This guy messaged me and he said, do you really speak Japanese? And I said, Watashi wa Rachel desu or Genki desu ka? And he asked me on a date a week later. Uh, and so we went on a date and I saw him and I thought, bloody hell, Rachel, you're punching. This is going to last. He's pretty hot. And we had two or three more dates. And then I was going to Cyprus with a friend of mine, Melinda, who I mentioned earlier, who got me working in Greece dancing. And we went away to Greece for two weeks, uh, Cyprus, sorry. And we, we spoke every day. I spoke to this guy every day. And then the day I was landing, he said, oh, he says, I work on the oil rigs. I'm, I'm actually going away for three months on the day you get back. I'm like, oh. You know, this is just never going to work. I really like this guy. So anyway, came back and he was only actually in Mablethorpe. Um, and so I went to see him every weekend that I could. So it was a couple of hours. And then after that three months, he went up to Falkirk. Which is like five, six hours away. But I still, I went to see him. He came to see me. And it was a really perfect start to the best thing that's ever happened to me. And... I guess the the one thing that um, was a negative, a big negative sort of thing over my life, he, he changed it into the the most the, the best thing ever because he's now my husband. Uh, we've been together for six years. We got married in the first August lockdown, and he's just made my life so much richer to the point where quite early actually when I met him. I realised I don't need to have kids to be happy. This man has given me so much that actually now the thought of bringing a child into it, and we did have the conversation, and he kind of looked at me and said, well, if you got pregnant, I'd support you. <laughs> no, well, Also, don't, don't forget, he does have the massive brood. 
<laughs> yeah, brood. <laughs> so, uh, but I started to think, do you know what? I actually don't want to have a child come in and mess this up because this is great. And obviously, if we'd have got pregnant, it would have been amazing. Um, I actually don't think I could have kids if I wanted to. But so very quickly, he again, my direction changed. So you talked earlier about bad things happen, but actually you just change direction. Uh, and he he's made huge differences to my outlook, my um, my view of myself, my view of other people. He's taught me more than he would he can ever know, to be honest. And he's made me realise that. Well, I probably still regret, I'd like to have seen what my son or daughter might have looked like. Um, I know moving forwards, I can sleep nine hours a night. I've got some spare cash. Um, I haven't got the stress that you're going to have for the rest of your life because they don't leave home at 18 and you stop worrying about. And my mum has explained to me that at 53, I'm still a baby girl. She still says, are you going to put a coat on? Have you eaten? You know, <laughs> so, so that was... Um, that was my second regret, kind of a long, long description. And then my third one, which is quite a funny one, and I never forget this, but it's a moment when I felt the biggest ever, and it was on holiday in Puerto Ventura, and I was sunbathing topless, and there was a, they, they were shutting down the bar, and they were getting rid of everything in the bar, and I wanted this mirror that they had. And what they did was, every time they brought something out, it was the first person to run round that could get the thing that they were holding up for free. Um, no idea how I was going to get it home. I was lying there topless, you know, this was in my phase of trying to attract male attention to have some babies, by the way. Um, and he, he brought out this mirror and I was like, and I ran and I skidded, scooped and splatted straight in the water and felt all right, no. So that was my third regret. Did you get the mirror? I did. Well, there you go. So then you've got the, so in your, in your regret number two and regret number three, you just need to take a little bit of your own advice in that what what you perceived as being an absolute disaster actually resulted in 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 a positive. And I sort of with, with the middle one there with with the children one. I, I'm I'm glad it I'm glad you finished it the way you did because I was sort of thinking I don't know I don't know what to say. Uh, I got into a, a debate with one of Natasha's friends years ago uh, and it was it was about um it, it was about sort of like teaching people and uh, I thought she's like a psychologist or psychotherapist or something so deals with children who've been through trauma and there was sort of she came out with a line about how it people people have a right to have children um or something like that that, that was probably meant in a completely different way but it, I thought I was like, well, hang on a minute. No, it's it, having children isn't a right. It's a privilege, and it's a privilege that is afforded to most of us, but not all of us. Whether that's biological or whether it's just sort of the look of the draw, or you, or you you don't find the right person at the right time. But it is a massive privilege to be able to to have children, and and not everybody has that that privilege, and of I have been given that privilege. You haven't, and I, I, I was sort of thinking, "Shit, what the fuck can I say that's going to be that's 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 going to be the right thing when there's only the wrong things to say?" And I was extremely relieved that you sort of you solved the problem for yourself. You joined the dots together, and you said that from did you, you talked about how from being a teenager having children was your thing so for 30 40 years of your life nearly this was an aim and a goal and this is what i'm going to do i'm going to have children and and everything throughout your 20s and 30s revolved around having this thing for you that was children for some people it could be marriage it could be a house it could be a rolex it could be a lamborghini like the, i'm going to have this thing and when i have this thing that's what's going to make me complete and it's going to make me so happy but then through terrible luck on one hand you found your fella and then you realize yourself that actually now and you, i think at one point you might i might misquote you slightly you said well i, I hope we don't have children because if we, if i do it will ruin 
this other thing that I didn't even know existed until a few months ago. And now I've got this thing. I don't want anything. I've got so much out of this. That something else will might might ruin it. Um, that's all right. Using children is an extreme example to make that point. But the, it's the same thing as the personal trainer who's like, right, when I earn 10 grand a month or when I buy this car or when I get to 10,000 followers, I'm going to be so happy. And it might not be like that. And if that thing doesn't happen, there might be something else out there and you don't even know what it is. And that is what's going to fucking bring everything together for you. And life will be different forever in a, in a positive way. Yeah. I, 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 to be blunt, it's from the age of four. I wanted babies. My, my mum, wow. when I was four years old at school, they said to you know each child one at a time, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a mummy from the age of four. And it was probably more of a, I'm going to have babies than even my other girlfriends. Uh, you ask any of my friends, they will always say, I'm just, I'm like a, a baby magnet. I, I'm just drawn to them on buses. You know, when you're walking along, I, I just, I'm so drawn to children, um, young children, babies. I want to have a cuddle. I want to play with the toddlers. You know, adults, no, you're you're out the window. I want to, I want to go and get on the bouncy castle. But you don't, you don't do you don't do sleepovers, do you? Because I've got a couple I could drop off. Send them over. Uh, but I, it's still a coping mechanism that I see the benefit in not having kids. Yeah. Because it is still there's st it's still there. My hormones have now well I'm managing them with HRT for a start, but. The body clock has now quietened, but it's all, I think it will always be there. I always wished I could have had kids, but the coping strategy is that, as you say, I've got Hunter now and, you know, and, and my two babies, <laughs> my two babies, anybody who's listening and not watching, uh, my two babies are snoring in the back, uh, the two old English bulldogs, Broxy and Mackie, you know. So I now have found joy in life and living and being in them. Yeah, uh, of course, I've got 13 grandkids that I can give back when I'm napping. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I, I again, I'm not I'm not clinically trained in any of this. But when I sort of when I try to explain to people about stress, I sort of use like a metaphor, which might be a complete load of bollocks. But I sort of say, if you imagine like a bucket, you've got a bucket that you can put all your stress in. And that stress could come from financial stress pull a bit in the bucket it might be physical stress if you're training too much it might be like self-inflicted stress if you're putting pressures on yourself it might be relationship but basically you just put all of these different sources of stress go into one bucket and then either that bucket fills up and overflows and you've got a problem or you need to have a valve in there somewhere where you can release it, whether you do that through whatever it is that, that de-stresses you. It might be the way you think. It might be like you go to boxing or, or whatever. And I like, again, that might not be the most perfect, most clinical way of ex of describing how stress works. But it, in my silly little head, it, it it makes sense and it's easy to to sort of to tell people. And I sort of the reason I sort of use that example is because. People might think, oh, well, I can I can put myself under as much financial, sorry, as much physical stress as possible. And that's not related to I can't pay my phone bill and the financial stress. It's like, well, actually, they might all be linked and there's a way that they can help each other to, to, to be solved. And the reason I'm using that analogy is like, well, what if for you, you had you've, you've got like X amount of, I don't know, love to give or happiness to experience and there's like a limit there and by not having some of that with your own biological children gives you more room that you can invest into a relationship and into work i'm not saying it's impossible to have a good relationship with your own kids and with your own partner and with your own career and with your own friends but something has to give and if you sort of like got one piece of the jigsaw that's not there is is the positive flip side of that that it gives you even more capacity within your bucket of happiness for with dogs 
<laughs> husbands, his grandchildren, and and, and work. Well, I, I don't know. I might be chatting complete bollocks, but it just it, in my head it makes sense. And I, and again, as a coping mechanism, that is how I would be convincing myself rather than becoming Miss Faversham, dressing all in black and locking myself in the attic forever because there's this thing I wanted and I haven't achieved it. Therefore, it's going to ruin everything. I thought, well, actually, that's how I would stick it to one side. I'm aware of it and I'm going to go back to it. I might even have a little cry about it now and then, but it's not going to fucking affect these things that are now even better than they would have been if I had thrown in another spanner into the works maybe yeah, it comes back to those the, the circle of care and the circle of control you know i can't control the fact uh that i can't have kids or you know i'm of an age now where um i'm on hrt i'm menopausal i'm probably things don't work husbands might still he's 55 guys can still produce but but actually um it, it's been out of my control um, what I can control is the environment I'm in now and the happiness that I've got. So even when I could and it wasn't happening, it was the realisation that I was trying to force it, but it was just giving me heartache and stress and it was like, just got to leave it. And, and if it happens, it happens. And when I got to that point, kind of letting it go, I was happier. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and someone listening to this, I hope could translate that same metaphor into, I don't know, let's say they've been doing a job for 20 years that actually they regret or they regret doing or they wish they had studied that course or I wish I set up my own business doing making cakes or whatever. It's like, well, actually, it's like by not putting yourself under so much pressure and just accepting it, but investing the energy in a positive way elsewhere who knows what positive thing might might come out of it I, for, for me i think there's an important lesson in there from your misfortune for want of a better word but to but but that's given you ridiculous amount of fortune how many people have a relationship where truly and honestly they can say they are so much better off just from being with that person that they're with i would dare say probably a majority of people will say the opposite to that if, if they were completely honest and they were talking to themselves they'd probably feel like they're held back by their partner or they resent their partner for various reasons and they're together for the wrong reasons um whereas the fact that the fact that you have that and have found that yeah. is way better than most other people could could wish for yeah he, he uh, i had always got this idea of the, the perfect man for me you know and you based it on a benchmark of your dad and your brothers and and the people who you see as being that's that's a man or that's my protector or that's my hero who's going to be able to step into those shoes and never before and I've had some wonderful boyfriends by the way if any of them are listening um, I've had some great boyfriends but none of them would they were still missing something I met Hunter and I knew within a couple of days oh, this guy is special mm. this, there's a dignity about this man that I, I I know I want to spend time with him and actually for the first 18 months of our relationship he was working abroad on the oil rigs and I think it was a good thing. We both we've talked about this because it gave us the space. We were both strongly independent, happily independent, um, and so we weren't looking for what we ended up with particularly. But it gave us that breathing space because you know that honeymoon phase where you just want to rip each other's yeah. clothes every minute of a day. So you're together so much that you then go, oh, yeah, this is a bit much, and you back off. So the actual 18 months of him working away and we saw each other just when we could was a really good gradual introduction and he wore his heart on his sleeve very early on. So I, I recognised his um, honesty and his integrity and, and yeah, he was wonderful right from the beginning. I was Smith, still am. Yeah, good good for you and for him. Uh, but that, that, that approach, that gives you a much better 
organic uh, approach to the relationship, doesn't it? Which every everything lasts longer when it develops develops organically. But like whether that's selling selling something or whether it's a, a relationship with somebody like if you if you got the gift of the gab and you're going to pull the wool over someone's eyes just to just to sell them a product that's going to be shit for them like you, you're probably not going to make that much money in business sense but if you're if you've got something of good enough value and you talk about it confidently enough for long enough and you find the right audience that need it then you're going to do you're going to do much better and it grows gradually when it's ready you, you can't sort of if you try to force it like i said at the start of the podcast like right i'm gonna set up a podcast and the aim is to get a thousand listeners per show and then ten thousand and then by next year i'll need to get a hundred thousand like, well, but then what what are you gonna force it like just yeah. fucking do it and enjoy it and if it's good enough people will people will find it and they'll they'll, they'll come to you and it will grow organically yeah, absolutely well i'm raving about it it's brilliant Good. thank you um next question we're nearly done uh, the meaning of life for you i mean I, I could probably have a stab at answering a bit of this on your behalf but i won't do but um what is what is the meaning of life and why do you think that some people struggle uh, yeah, this this, uh, I, this is another one that i pondered when i was out running listening to you other podcasts and i think it was a lesson my dad taught me very early on is um, purpose. There's got to be a point. Um, there's got to be a reason to get up in the morning. Um, it doesn't have to be one thing. It could be a multitude of things. But you've got to feel that you have a purpose, whether it's um, intrinsic, um, whether it's altruistic. Having a driver, and I, if, you, if anybody's ever read... Um, Man's Search for Meaning, so Viktor Frankl, which is a book that Stephen H recommended I read, and it had a powerful effect on me about the Holocaust, which is a really grim uh, story, as everybody will know. But I, th I think I think actually that was Shari's book, her last book that she right. read. Yeah, and it, and it was um, this sort of what's the point when you're in this grim situation, you're going through stresses, or you're kind of pondering life, and you think, yeah, what's the point? So I think purpose is the meaning of life. And like the others have said before me, it's going to be different for different people. Um, but but you have to have a purpose. That's where people lose the will to live is they, they either feel they have no purpose. Uh, they're not important. They're not making a difference. They're not driven every day. And I don't mean driven as in I'm going to get up and be an entrepreneur. I mean, just getting out of bed and, and feeling like, right, I've got something to do. Um, so I think having purpose, but also alongside that, the sort of the humanity side of, you know, love thy neighbour, be, be nice to other people. Be, you, I don't really watch the news much. My husband fills me in because he watches things like that a lot. But that kind of see, I see everybody. I always trust people. I think most people in this world are good. Most people are uh, kind and thoughtful. They may not seem it at certain times when they're bipping the horn at you, um, you know, when they're coming up and tailgating you, but maybe they've got a shit stuff going on and they're not necessarily a bad person. Mm -hmm. um, so I think purpose and, and being good to fellow human beings. Yeah, I, I, I like both of those. Um, and you sort of, as you were saying that there, I was thinking of that, 18 year old Rachel Ainscock who was stuck in bed refusing to get out had no purpose had didn't know didn't probably didn't even know what day it was or why she should bother getting up and then it comes back to my other thing I talk about all the time about these conflicting opposites and do you have to have do you have to feel like you've got so little purpose to then really find something that gives you a huge amount of purpose like if you 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 have both of those extremes i think that's probably a lot more powerful than if you just plod down the middle on the fence nice and safe all the time and you don't you don't go much further than a foot either side of the fence uh, on any matter like i i honestly like those extremes of no purpose to now look at the purpose that you bring like whether you've touched on the 
from from a romantic perspective or from a personal private perspective but even professionally as well the number of people who operate under your tenure and guidance and, and influence to to move better and and use their bodies more effectively sort of thing there's uh there's that purpose is your purpose is ridiculously large yeah d totally um getting up every day with a reason and i look forward to you know the thought of retiring and i think what will be my purpose at that point like watching my parents dad's 87 uh um, as i said in her 80s and 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 almost that that sadness where they they're losing some purpose um and i feel that quite a lot and so to, to you've got to re-establish purposes as life changes for you and if it's work at the minute i have a lot of purpose there but obviously my husband when i can retire with him we will find a purpose what will that be and, and thinking about what will drive you as you go through different parts of your life yeah, it yeah. Is it's, it's massive not like isn't it and this this is completely anecdotal but how many how many sort of stories do you hear where bob works his ass off for 50 years he retires drops dead three weeks later or prince philip dies at 101 god knows only a few months later the queen dies like there's how many times are you like people all right i know when old people get old they're always closer to death but what what if underneath does that loss of purpose like i'm bob i go to work every day that's what i do i, I do these 12 hour shifts four on four off that's what i've always done i'm the manager at my factory now i've hit retirement i'm going to enjoy the next 20 years on the golf course after a few weeks of pottering around in his shed bob realizes what's my fucking purpose like is that that might not kill him but it might not keep him alive longer like or if you if your purpose is you you've got a a partner someone you've grown up with for decades and decades and decades and when they've gone what am i doing here like is like, what's my purpose like ricky gervais the um the 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 show he did on on netflix where the the, the wife dies yeah. and he's the left what's his purpose like he goes down all sorts of paths like is is it i don't know it's completely anecdotal but i would rather have a purpose and not need it than need a purpose and not have it that is for sure exactly yeah um how do you want to be remembered and this is your first bit of your homework so the homework attached to this question which should be question two but has become oh no, it should be question three but it's become question well, it's my show i can do what i like can't i um <laughs> The bit of the bit of homework that is attached to it is 70 characters of text that you would put on a headstone. Now, there's a couple, I think two or three of my six guests so far have interpreted that as 70 letters, which is probably my miscommunication. So they need to have a big fucking headstone, like one of these like three foot high blocks of granite or something to get 70 words on it but it doesn't i'm not counting you're not going to get marks down but it's a short synopsis of how you want to be remembered so do you want to go with the headstone text first and then we'll dissect it and answer the question of how you want to be remembered yeah dead easy uh i won't have a tombstone by the way um, i'm gonna have a bench a top of a hill with a nice view and you know you see those benches i love walking around parts where they have the benches with the little plaques on and it says daisy and barry whatever 1943 to whatever uh, together again blah 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 and there's a bunch of flowers on the bench so it would be a bench rather than a tombstone if it was up to me and it would say quite simply she made a difference but underneath that it would say www.ragefit.com <laughs> so that then the viewer or the person reading goes oh i wonder who that is i'm gonna go and google that um because when i read them and and it kind of touched on it last time is what was really great was when robin was saying about um you know it's about motivating the reader you're not here anymore so I don't know who Daisy was, who's Daisy and Barry to me, 
But yeah. if they motivate me to do something or learn something or change something, then I continue to have purpose. So um, the bench, yeah, I would say she made a difference. www.rachbit.com or www.imefreely.com. And then they could go and they'd have a look and they go, oh, wow, oh, wow. Also, the lady whose bench is on the hill at such and such a park. Yeah. Oh, and then when they go to that that bench and they sit on it and they look out and they might think about doing their four sign MET or I don't know. So, yeah. It is, it, it's the perfect answer. And, you know, it's weird. Like a, few, a couple of weeks ago, I was I was thinking, so I sit when I walk, take the dog for a walk, like 45 minutes every morning and every evening. And most of the time I talk to myself like out loud. I like even I, I ask myself one of these questions and I'll talk like, out like I'm talking now, like a complete fucking weirdo. And I'll and I'll have a conversation with myself for like stuff like that. And I was thinking about my own, what I would what I would have and and I was at, literally I think it was yesterday I was having the conversation with myself about how most things yeah it will sort of say it would say like Mark 1981 to whatever year it is I've, I've passed it and like a beloved son father uncle and husband uh, blah 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 like something like that I was like that that tells you who I am but it doesn't tell you anything about me and I was thinking do you know what I've got I've got like a line of text that I will share when I am the guest on my own show. I've got a couple of options, but I was like, I could put like a QR code on there as well. So I want I want someone to walk through the cemetery, and if they sort of they see all these other things, it just sort of lists people and who they are and whatever. I'm like oh, mother and daughter, blah blah blah. Well, yeah, we we probably could have guessed all of that. I like I'll stick a QR code, scan it, and that QR code might take you to a video message of me saying, yeah. "Listen up, fuckers! Like this is who I am. This is what I think. Like here's my lessons on what I wish I knew when I was 20, or the, these are the things that that helped me, stuff like that." And I like that in the same way that you've sort of just mentioned there. Like you continue to give value, you make it interesting that someone stumbles across your memorial yeah. but they so get, why, they... Have why have one mark if yeah it, it, it's not about the self to have a tombstone has to be about the person reading it it's yeah. got to be, otherwise you know you're not here anymore so it doesn't make sense to have it about you it should be about the, the reader who, yeah who that could be i thought i'd stumbled across like a, a, a multi-million pound like <laughs> empire of recording people qr code engrave it on the on the stone and then i found like I, as soon as i googled it i found a um a, an undertaker it was in paul in dorset or in bournemouth in dorset around there somewhere who who had done it and it was dated like 2012 or something like that it was like 10 11 12 years ago okay. this this um this person started doing it and i was like brilliant i knew it was a fucking good idea and I don't care that I'm now not going to make the money from it because <laughs> someone else has already got that idea. But but yeah, the the per the reason that I asked that question is so I asked you how do you want to be remembered? Like, imagine if like you've got an eight million word diary that someone could trawl through if you got hit by a bus tomorrow. They they might they, you might you probably might have this sort of stuff written down. Most people won't. And you could let's say for example if that wasn't written down anywhere and if you'd never had that conversation with hunter or myself if you went and got hit by a bus tomorrow and someone goes oh like rachel france here's the date so like beloved uh godmother and daughter stuff like that the end you'd be like for fuck's sake like what I wanted was a bench. I want it on the top of the hill so people have got to put effort in to walk up there and enjoy the fresh air and the countryside. And then they can go on my website and I'm, I've left thousands of articles and videos and hours of stuff that can help them. Like that's what I want. So now people know that. That's that's what you'll get. But how many people die and they they don't they don't they either don't get what they wanted. Or they don't even know how to answer that question. How do you want to be remembered? And they're like, I don't know. Well, if you don't know how you want to be remembered, what purpose do you wake up with every day that then impacts your actions and your behaviours and your interactions with people to achieve 
you being remembered in the way you want to be remembered. Like fucking think about it. And if you if you listen to this and you don't ever think about it, go for a walk, talk to yourself out loud when no one's listening and ask yourself the question and answer it. Because if you work all this backwards, like what are your regrets? Be honest about them. Like what, how do you want to be remembered? What do you think the meaning of life is? And then the first question, who is Rachel France? Who is Mark Laws? Who are you? We sort of, if you start from the end and you answer the questions backwards, you then develop you, you start to realise who you actually are and you might not just be a job title and a hobby or or a father and a husband or whatever. You like there might be something deeper inside you, like that that purpose that you just hadn't ever sort of I don't know, put a label on or hadn't I you hadn't realised or identified. And and for me it's such a brilliant journey to go through personally to you go, ah, I kind of now I am developing my own purpose, which is something that you alluded to having listening to other people being interviewed in this way. You had gained things from it. When I spoke to Sophie, so I'm moving on to the last bit now, which means we're really nearly done um, with the letter. Sophie wrote her letter and in the four or five days between writing the letter and recording the show, she had changed the way she lived her life. She said yes to things that she would have said no to because the letter writing the letter had made her realize that if she doesn't change her actions and behaviors then this letter isn't gonna make sense to my to myself in 10 years time and uh, it's it, it just it, it interests me and fascinates me anyway to to see how different people piece it all together yeah, no, absolutely. And that's what I took as well from Sophie's is, is that she got reflective uh, just from your questions and simple questions, but just so open. Um, so, yeah. Um, last bit then before my dog kicks off too much. The letter. I've got I've just uh, if anybody's uh, on the YouTube, my husband's arrived home and he's just ragging the dogs with a flirt pole so uh, oh okay no it's all right it's all right it's fine he knows i've told You're him telling we, we, we won't be long um but that, that's my joy when he comes home and then we can go out and uh, and have a nice walk in the uh, in the leaves um you can't, you can't beat it the last question sorry what was that so it's we're we're, up, we're down to the letter yeah yeah so this was the hardest one to the point where I still hadn't written it last night and I, I kind of cheated uh, because I'm going to use someone else's words predominantly um, and there's something that connected Hunter and I very early on that makes me realise how insignificant I am and I mean that in a positive way so um, there was a, a gentleman called Carl Edward Sagan, who was um, born in 1934, died in 1996. And he was an American astronomer, 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 uh, a planet scientist, a cosmetologist, an astrophysicist, an astrobiologist, author and science communicator. But he um, wrote about an image that was captured of earth as they were flying away from it as they look back um, and if you haven't seen it if anybody who's listening hasn't seen it if you just google the pale blue dot don't know if you ever heard of it no. um, and it was an afterthought while they were out doing what they were doing in space and they just went oh let's just take one last shot as they look back and happen chance that as they took the photo of Earth, there was a, a, a sunbeam coming down that captured it. And if, if you pull up the image, or if you Google it after the show, Mark, and have a look at it, and he's written a book, but his words hit me really deeply in, this is what I would like, this letter, I guess, is to every other human out there, that if they can feel something from this. He wrote about our planet, and if you look at it, you see just a dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, every 
other human being who's ever lived in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The fact that our planet is a lonely speck in all the vastness underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. His speech was much longer than that, but when you pull up a big image of that shot of, of Earth, I found it breathtaking and really made me realise how insignificant I am in, in the whole scheme of things, and yet I'm able to feel such a huge sense of responsibility as an educator. You know, I've had huge amounts of love in my my life from my parents. Um, if I was writing to them to thank them on the the depth of confidence they instilled in me, my ability to love myself. You know, my dad teaching me purpose and camaraderie when we're out running. My mum teaching me insight into acceptance of diversity and empathy for anybody who's different um, and obviously you know I would write something to my husband about the fact that everything before him now makes sense and he turned my heartbreak into meaning um, and changed my regret into gratitude so it's a disjointed letter but I think I would not be able to speak if I actually wrote a letter and tried to read it <laughs> on this uh, podcast because trying to write it, I was struggling without feeling emotional. And and I think now coming into my 50s, every decade, Mark, has got better for me. Every decade, I felt more, I felt more. I cry more, but I do it openly. I'm, you know, I'm more emotional. I, I feel more, but I'm in a good place with it. So... To be able to write a letter would be virtually impossible. Who do I write it to? How many people do I write it to? How do I say it without it sounding cheesy? So I wanted to take those words to sort of finish my letter to all humans. Understand how insignificant you are and yet how powerful you can be on that moat of dust. Yeah, that's it's a, it's a really interesting way of way of looking at it. And when when you talked about earlier, uh, I think it was when you were talking about the importance of finding a purpose to get you up out of bed every day to 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 have a meaning and a reason to do stuff for that day. I very nearly if there, if there would have been a pause in, in your sentences anywhere, I was going to interject with the contrast of if you zoom out from my house to look at my county the country the whole world the universe and you keep zooming out and zooming out and realizing how pathetically small we are as a as a planet compared to like the, the the universe or the solar system that we that, that we're suspended in like it can be really daunting to try to find a purpose when if you realize how small and insignificant we are but at the same time if you can accept how small and insignificant we are but use that to find to, to sort of rather than wasting time doing things that you don't enjoy or if you it's by understanding and appreciating how small we are and how like a fraction of amount of time we're here for. All right, if you live to your eight, you uh, say your mum's 81, dad's 87. That's a huge innings compared to most to average people. That's still not very long. If you speak to them, they'll say it feels like yesterday when they were running around with their socks up to their knees, like playing whatever they played in the in the playground at school in the in those days it would have gone by like a flash and the older you get the quicker christmas comes around every year it's like fucking jesus christ it can't be christmas again it was like three weeks ago like the school holiday six weeks holidays when you were a kid lasted all year now six weeks goes i can forget to reply to a message in six weeks and it it feels like it was only yesterday like it but by under by appreciating accepting how small and significant we are that's for me that's my driver to 
the, the flippant fuck it type attitude like maybe it's not worth holding that grudge with that person about that thing that really doesn't fucking matter if you zoom out and look at the grand scheme of things and like well let's say i've been lucky enough to be here for 40 years and hopefully that i might be halfway i might be past halfway who knows but like every every day week month and year that i get after today is a is a bonus it's like it's a it's a privilege it's a it's a good thing like why waste some of that time being fucking angry and like i don't know um you know, i've got a problem with people wasting time if they're doing things that they enjoy but it's it's like that it's it's if you're building more and more and more anger and angst and frustration and regret and and all those types of things without saying do you know what fuck it I'm going to do this and it makes me happy. And just because that doesn't fit into the, what used to be called the American dream or keeping up with the Joneses or, or anything like that, just because it doesn't fit that textbook, perfect traje trajectory of what a good life looks like. Fuck it. I, I'm going to do it. I, I'll do it my way. I'll do it differently. And who cares? Because in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter? And very, very little actually matters like it i um my my friend's dad died a, a few months back and there's a, a group of four of us that were friends at school and we went on holiday together straight after school and we we all went the three of us went to it to his dad's funeral to sort of just to, to be there and to support him a little bit and, and we stood there afterwards chatting in the crematorium like me and my other two mates while while nick was still, still chatting to people leaving and I sort of sort of stand there, look around, and you can see like the traffic on the road still going by. And I, I sort of said to them, I was like, it's weird, isn't it? How we're standing here. One of our mates is just about to bury his dad in a hole in the floor. And just over there, everyone's got to go to work, got to get Starbucks, got to get home, got to go to the cinema. But no, none of those people are even aware that we're here. It's just, life goes on that doesn't mean you don't care about what's happened but it's just so it's just so insignificant for for such a considering how small we are in yeah death, and death is inevitable it's one yeah. of the things that you can absolutely 100 percent guarantee every human will die and um, that is inevitable and yet we're so ill prepared we're so uncomfortable talking about it. We're so uncomfortable uh, when it happens. And, and yet it's the most inevitable thing that will, it's guaranteed no matter what you do, that is the one thing that will definitely happen to you. So yeah. why is it such a struggle to talk about when, uh, and why is it so hard to feel uh, when somebody does pass away? And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, but it, it's just interesting, isn't it? When, when you think how, that mote of dust and and you know what's out there and where we are and how small I am within my little bubble here and you know how insignificant I am and yet I can feel so much and do so much and have so much responsibility and achieve and blah 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 uh, but I am going to die and then what well, then what so yeah. what you know yeah sadly for, <laughs> for 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 seven odd billion people on the planet it'd be like so what like who who's died never heard of her like okay well there's a bench on that hill go and fucking scan the, scan the qr code or type in the website and you'll you'll know who she is but it's um, oh come on <laughs> yeah um rachel we're done uh, i appreciate i appreciate your time massively uh and i'm glad we finally sort of got around to getting this done um i i know you're a busy lady and that's much appreciated and i appreciate you humoring me and sort of talking so candidly and, and openly about personal things that, uh, that that a huge number of people shy away from or ignore or definitely don't share on a podcast that could be heard by literally dozens of people um a lot of stuff i haven't shared but i i would never share <laughs> well that's that's why I, when i that's why i'll get you on i'll get you on next year for a second a second show and you can start drip feeding some of that i retire when when business is less of a <laughs> i need to be <laughs> careful what i say <laughs> so.
So I'll no, come back well, when I retire. Well, you'll, you'll always be welcome back anyway. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks for inviting me on, Mark. Love you, Joe. No, no problem at all. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. And I appreciate you being s such a vocal advocate of the show uh, and yeah, the, the, the more people who talk about it or tell people about it the the, the better so I, like i say i get that slow steady organic growth but i think there's a lot of messages in there that that people can relate to and learn from and and sort of reflect upon and and hopefully improve well, their a, own lives let's have a photo for my i'll put it out there that was going to be coming out so you, we'll smile or something more so in fact shows your jumper stand up and do your jumper I guess who? Yeah. Well, my face <laughs> in there as well. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll promote it when it's going out. Brilliant. Yeah. Cool. Rachel, I'll leave you to it. You've got your man with the massive brood to go and see to. <laughs> and um, and I will, I'll get this up. This will be up probably Sunday. Brilliant. Saturday, Sunday sometime. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.